So my name is Sean Ostertheiler. I am a Director of Educational Infrastructure Systems here at UC San Diego. And my team is largely responsible for providing IT resources in support of instruction around campus. So we do things like, uh, you know, manage the computer labs, you know, provide remote computing environments, that sort of thing. Been with the university for 23 years now, so I'm well versed with, uh, you know, the, the needs of our campus community. I'm looking forward to speaking with you guys today about, you know, some of the things that we've done over at UCS, UC San Diego. Uh, well, so I work in uh, Sean's team. I am a lab and now cloud labs uh, system administrator. I'm specifically uh, running our Parto instance and keeping up to date with that. I work in IT for 23 years and entirely working in education, mostly working with students and faculty to facilitate classes. My name is Dan Suki. I'm Senior Director of Educational Technology Services under our uh, CIO Vince Kellen. ITS, who's the organization we all belong, is, provides a gamut of IT all the way from procurement, business, HR, research IT, to technology that supports teaching and learning. And that's where Mike, Sean, and I uh, reside in. That's our passion and that's where we're fortunate to work. UC San Diego, like many other uh, K through 12 and higher ed institutions across our country and the world really, we needed to act quickly once COVID-19, once the pandemic really started to get serious and gain momentum. I've heard it said before that uh, innovation is often born out of necessity. And that really was true for us in this particular case. We wanted to take the pandemic as an opportunity to create a product to address a problem that we were facing. And it just so happens that that product was something we were already working towards prior to the pandemic anyways. We had been wanting to do some exploration, replacing some of our physical computer labs with cloud hosted services uh, that students could access from their own devices. And we had run a couple of pilot projects, one of which of course was with you guys here at Oporto. Uh, but up until COVID uh, hit, that was really about as far as we had gotten in that space. However, once our campus was officially closed uh, back in March and we were all sent home, we had to do something fast to ensure uh, continuity of instruction at the university. And so what we came up with over the period of, I don't know, probably two to three weeks of long days and hard work uh, was a service that uh, we're locally referring to as Cloud Labs. What Cloud Labs is, is a, a multi-pronged approach uh, at providing instructional IT resources remotely to our students. And by that, I mean, uh, we are utilizing several different uh, cloud services and remote access methods to give our students access to software applications that they would normally uh, traditionally access through uh, systems that we maintain in our on-campus facilities. So we are using uh, you know, a variety of technologies, uh, technologies like AWS AppStream and Aporto, um, those are the bread and butter uh, of our solution, but we're also using some other things as well. We uh, performed a modest upgrade to a, um, an on-prem Horizon View VDI environment that we already had. And we're using uh, Apache's Guacamole as a web-based front end to provide remote desktop um, access to some of our on-campus lab computers. And I would say that all of these services combined uh, provide a reasonably comprehensive solution for our faculty. And it allows us the flexibility to choose the environment or technology that best suits their course needs based on system requirements, user experience, and capacity considerations. In particular, uh, the cloud-based solutions like Aporto, they tend to give us the greatest flexibility since they're very robust, highly scalable, and in some cases offer better performance than what we can provide uh, with our current on-prem resources. So I would say that these technologies, probably first and foremost, like I mentioned, allowed for the continuity of education throughout the pandemic thus far. Were it not for us having all of these tools at our disposal, this would have probably been next to an impossible task for us. Our solutions have enabled our campus community to socially distance and remain at home um, in order to keep everybody safe but still allow learning to continue without skipping a beat. And faculty have really appreciated, I think, the comprehensive set of resources that we've been able to spin up and provide for them. They've been easily uh, able to adapt their curriculum to those resources. I would say students, you know, they've appreciated probably the ease in which we, we give them access to these resources. 
And administrators probably, uh, you know, our CIO, Vince Kellen included, they are particularly ecstatic about the type of analytic data that we can get out of uh, these environments, either using the tools that are built into a Porto or similar environments, or through an add-on third-party tool such as LabSets. All of those tools combined allow us to measure logon activity and application usage, things like that, and really get a sense for how the environment is working for our users. Our fall quarter is really going to be the test for how all of this works, though. During the spring and summer sessions, we had a modest amount of uh, usage in these environments, but as UCSD has partially reopened here in the fall uh, as part of our Return to Learn uh, initiative, we're seeing a greater number of requests for Cloud Labs resources come in and other uh, related IT services. So it's, it's gonna be interesting to see how it all plays out. Like every major university and even the small ones, we were instructed with about two, two and a half weeks lead time to go virtual for spring quarter. And that was a big switch. We really had to rely on vendors like Porto to, to get us up to speed, to get software installed. And really, we'd done some initial testing with VDIs and virtual environments, like Sean said, and, and we got buy-in and faculty were interested, but I think that uh, the, a lot were reluctant to leave their in-person, the type of uh, education and learning that they've been offering for so long. And I think really what it was that, that enabled this was the necessity. We had COVID, we had this, this thing that we were up against, and where we might not have got buy-in, we may not have got funding, all of a sudden those things were available and honestly just required. We needed to go virtual if we wanted to have students be able to do assignments, uh, uh, do their coursework. So really the biggest thing that enabled this, uh, facilitated us going to these virtual environments was the chancellor coming and saying, make everything work remotely because we can't have students on campus. Honestly, I feel like one of the biggest things that uh, really helped us is we worked a lot directly with the vendors and some vendors are not as great at uh, interfacing, um, more big nebulous boxes that uh, you have to pay a bunch of money to learn how to use. And um, other vendors like Aporto were really great at um, you know reaching out to us, uh, answering any questions uh, really fast about will this work? Uh, can we use this license server on campus? And you know we partnered a lot with our vendors, ended up helping us out immensely. The responsiveness of Aporto and the experience we had dealing with with the people at Aporto was really amazing. And that that the vendor partnership I think was one of the biggest uh, most important things that to us during the transition. That's a really good question. So first what I want to do is kind of take off the tech hat and put on kind of the pedagogy hat. There's a lot of talk about active learning environments. Obviously we've had to move remotely. So that's been brought to universities earlier than we anticipated. But I'd say the first thing you do is you put all the tech aside, honestly. You put established tech like the learning management system side, and you put the new tech you might want to use to teach a course, like virtual labs, like a Porto, aside momentarily. Um, step two, what you do is you really design a course that meets the learning objectives that you want to provide. So you, do, you think to yourself, I'm an instructor, what do I want my students to learn? And you develop those learning objectives. Then what you do is you develop an engaging course that meets those learning objectives. And when I say engaging, I'm not talking about a two hour lecture delivered via Zoom, right? We're all familiar with that from college or maybe in high school, these long lectures. Um, that's the opposite of engaging. You know, if you wanna offer a course that's a two hour lecture, those should be pre-recorded and instead use that valuable in-person time to help students understand the concepts that they listen to in that lecture, help them synthesize that knowledge, and you can do that in a variety of ways. Work in smaller breakout groups with their peers. Tools like VR Labs, like a Porto, really help with that. You can have them work together around a software virtualized. Um, you know, and then step four, once you have that course designed, that's where the tech comes in. That's where you use a combination of tools leveraged in new ways. So we have learning management systems. We have video conferencing, right? We're all 
using video conferencing all day. We're all tired of video conferencing, but we use it all day. You can use things like live audience polling and feedback. And of course, new technologies, again, like Oporto. And of course, our university being primarily a STEM campus, it's an absolute need for us. So virtual labs uh, really are a, a piece in the total active learning package. It's about creating a community around your class. So again, you know, I mentioned earlier about the, you know, the, the paradigm of the two hour lecture. The problem with that is the students might not ever get to know the person who's virtually sitting next to them. Just like in an in-person classroom, they might never get to know that person sitting next to them in that kind of class, you know, that teaching paradigm. Um, so really it's about building community. It's about asking questions of your students, like really embracing questions, asking them questions about the content. It's about challenging their notions about what you're saying. It's also about getting a little controversial. You want to wake up your students that, that part of the brains that are already thinking about all the many issues in the world today, and obviously there are a lot, and engaging with that. And really um, asking them to engage each other with those sort of uh, topics. And you can do that in a variety of ways. And that's really how you, you spark the learning. The technology just, you know, it's just the tools to make that happen. I would say some limited active learning spaces. We had some, the typical university, we have flexible furniture rooms, things like that. And we try to re-engineer some of our class spaces to allow students to move, to allow them to get into groups that kind of think pair share model. Um, so we had some of that already. Uh, then all the challenges of being a large public university, obviously our classroom space is as valuable as real estate in La Jolla, where we are, so, which means um, there's a tendency to want to put as many students in a classroom as you can. And an active learning classroom kind of goes against that notion. Sean and Mike and I, we try to make these active learning spaces happen. I mean, right now it kind of has to be, right? I mean, you can't have students, you know, leaning to, into each other and, and working in small groups and talking to each other. So it kind of has to be, and you kind of have the, you need the technology to make that work. So going down the road, yeah, active learning is, is where it's at. You only learn when you synthesize that knowledge and you only synthesize knowledge when you engage it. You don't just, if you just listen to it and regurgitate it, you're not really synthesizing the knowledge. So I think that one of the things that has helped our students transition from in-person to remote instruction uh, has been everything that we've done to try and make sure that accessing the new systems that we've stood up, that we make that as easy as possible for them. As part of our Cloud Labs initiative, uh, one of the things that we did is we stood up a web portal that acts as a kind of a, a single point of entry um, to all of the various services that we're offering. And the students need to do nothing more than to uh, point their web browser at our Cloud Labs website. They log in with their university credentials and they're presented with a list of resources that they have access to that is uh, derived from the courses that they're actively enrolled in. And so all they need to do is click a button in that portal and they'll be taken directly to one of those uh, resources where they can log in and utilize the software that we've prepared for them. Also, I think just the familiarity of the environments, um, each of the environments that we are using, they have an easy to use and recognizable Windows desktop interface with icons easily accessible to launch all of the software that they might need to access for a particular course. For those that have difficulty, we've stood up a number of uh, how-to documents in our local knowledge base. And we also have a help desk that uh, triages incoming calls from the students you know, that are having trouble. And that help desk can either you know, help them directly there on the spot or they can uh, send the ticket over to, you know, whatever team could appropriately uh, help the student with their particular issue. Well, we, we had already had our Horizon View uh, VDI environment that people knew about that was available remotely. We also had some Unix environments that you could access remotely. So there was an awareness that there was a virtual element that people could get to remotely, but also in partnership with the Teaching and Learning Commons and uh, Dan's team, we had workshops and uh, sessions to, to educate faculty about the new Cloud Lab environments. And really, it, a lot of it, I think, was just word of mouth getting out that, oh, my students need software, what's going to happen? 
here's this Cloud Labs environment, ask about Cloud Labs. So that was really how we got it out. And then to keep it going, we've been trying to gather as much analytics as we can. Our CIO, Vince Kellen, is very data-driven and we've been collecting the data through the Aporto interface and the other interfaces we have. We, we've also been using uh, lab stats and uh, key server K2 to, you know, track software usage and show which environments are the most popular, getting the most use. And those analytics have been really useful uh, for the administration to see that, that our environments are getting use. The EBC, the chancellor actually seeing that things are happening and that, you know, and hopefully um, will continue once the, there isn't the COVID need to uh, get us funding to uh, keep these environments running by showing them just the, the, the sheer numbers and, and what's happening in the environment. A couple things come to mind. Um, so if we're talking about uh, products, you know, like Aporto and Virtual Computer Labs, I, you know, it's a couple of practical considerations for faculty is to understand first that there's a learning curve. It's not big, but there's a learning curve for them. There's a learning curve for their students. So to really take in the time to get over that curve, uh, get familiar with the technology, and that way you can run your course. Understand that your technology providers, like the three of us, are working long days and nights to make things like a Porto successful, both as a proxy for in-person labs and maybe something entirely new. And that takes time and expertise. And so the earlier we know about what software you need to virtualize, the better we can help. And we can have it completely ready for you at day one. So the earlier we know, the better. We had started talking about this probably two to three years ago. We're doing the best on our end to, uh, you know, carve out some time to run a, uh, you know, set of pilots uh, with a Porto. We hadn't really gotten past that to that point. I mean, it was one of those things that uh, we really wanted to do, but it just never seemed like there was enough time uh, in the day for us to kind of shift gears from our normal day-to-day uh, -day operational activities to try out something new and figure out, you know, how that would play into what we're actively doing for campus. And so it Unfortunately, it kind of took, you know, something like COVID to put us in a position where we were forced to carve out that time and figure out how we wanted to handle that sort of transition. From my perspective, it's hard to say for sure, you know, what the future is going to look like. You know, here at UC San Diego, like I said, even prior to COVID-19, we were looking at new ways to kind of intertwine and commingle online learning and cloud-based services with what we were doing in our physical spaces on campus. There were multiple reasons for that, you know, looking at ways to kind of reduce our capital expenditures on computer hardware. As Dan mentioned, we've got a lot of competition for physical space on campus. So places to install large computer labs is few and far between. We're also finding that we've got expanding enrollment on campus. And so, you know, classes are getting larger over time, you know, having rooms and labs that are large enough to accommodate the greater numbers of students that are enrolled in these courses is becoming, you know, a real challenge. And also, you know, the landscape around educational technology, I mean, it's continuously changing. What has become possible over the last few years may not have been possible a few years prior to that. We have been looking for a way to kind of supplement what we're doing in the, uh, the physical space on campus with, you know, virtual services that provide for, you know, always on, always available and easy accessible computing environments that students can get access to from their own devices, you know, wherever they happen to be at any given time of day. I will say that I think one of the things that we've learned from our efforts to pivot to remote instruction, though, is that certain types of teaching work well uh, via digital delivery services, uh, such as Zoom or the like. Other uh, types of courses do not really work well in that environment. There's also definitely a preference, I think, on the part of the faculty uh, and the students for that matter, which method, you know, of teaching they prefer. Some, you know, teachers like to uh, work from the comfort of their own home. Some students like to take their classes, you know, from their bedroom or wherever they happen to be. Others, you know, miss the in-person interaction that you can only get from in-person class sessions. COVID-19 uh, has caused a, a real paradigm shift in terms of uh, how we think about providing IT resources uh, in the instructional space. 
And I really believe that that paradigm or that shift in thinking, it's here to stay. The wide breadth of technology that we have at our disposal these days really means that the sky is the limit in terms of what we can do. And we need only work with our brilliant faculty to really create something that is game changing, not only for them, but for our students as well. I think that there will always be a push uh, from faculty like the Socratic model and want to be there and, and have people raising their hands and asking questions. I think the fully virtual model, while, while desirable, may never fully take place. However, again, you know, people, as we've learned from uh, being forced to work remotely, some people really adapt to that and some people thrive in that environment. Uh, you know, some people have other needs and even students may have a child or something, you know, something they need to take care of where they, it's better for them to be at home, but still be able to do their learning. So I think that uh, the hybrid model will probably be where UCSD and other major campuses settle uh, and all campuses settle because there will be some things, it's hard to teach a um, medical science class remotely because you're in your residency and you're walking around, you kind of need to see the patients and see the injuries, see the everything. Um, if you're doing a biology class and you have a microscope that you need to, to, to dissect things and put them under a microscope, that might need to happen in person, but there's plenty of other things that you can, you can do, you know, with the instructor giving their lectures synchronously or asynchronously, having office hours online, and maybe there isn't a need at all to, for the students to go in to be on campus all the time. So I think that a full hybrid model that's well thought out, which unfortunately, I think the only problem we've had recently is they're just even though the faculty are doing a great job, they haven't had the time to prep for a, a, a distance learning model. And I think once they have more time, it, the full hybrid is going to be what students want, what faculty want, and we can facilitate it with the cloud labs type systems like a Porto. I would just like to, uh, to thank all of you guys over at Aporto. Uh, we had talked about how our relationship has, has been several years in the making. I'm just really glad that it's all finally come to fruition. You know, even though it wasn't under the best of times or best of circumstances, you know, your service has, has really been key in providing some of this remote instruction and continuity of education that uh, our university uh, so desperately needed. So thank you.